What is post-traumatic stress disorder? Post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying, usually life-threatening event. PTSD can occur after someone goes through a traumatic event like combat, assault, or disaster. Most people will have some stress reactions after a trauma. If the reactions don't go away over time or disrupt your life, you may have post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's the deal. There's trauma and there's post-traumatic stress disorder. Trauma can occur or be triggered after an event. If that trauma doesn't go away, it's because it's turning into post-traumatic stress disorder. Here are some of the signs and symptoms. There we go in front of the camera. Witnessing, oh, I'm sorry, first some of the general causes. Witnessing too much death, human degradation, or man's inhumanity to man. Does anybody remember that as a young cop, seeing the way people treated each other and being, oh my God, I can't believe some of the things that people do to one another. Observing sexual abuse and other forms of brutality. I mentioned this the other day, giving a lecture, and I still think about it. When I was a young rookie, I had a four-year-old girl that was raped by her father. He had just gotten visitation back from the courts. Looking in that little girl's face and talking to her, I still remember like it was yesterday. I'll never, ever forget that. It's one of the most traumatic things I had ever seen. Police death and or shooting. Discovering the monster within. Basically what that means is cops doing things that they never thought that they were capable of, both lawful and not. You know, there's cops out there that uh, they get through this giant rumble or they get involved in a shooting and they think, they walk away going, man, I didn't know I could do that. Failure to engage in stress inoculation. I'll mention this again later. What stress inoculation is, is taking all this information that we're talking about, storing it in your brain, refreshing that information, and doing other things that you need to do to take care of yourself. For instance, if you know the signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and you know what may happen, there's a possibility that you'll decrease the possibility of getting post-traumatic stress disorder. Just knowing that this stuff's out there, being mentally prepared for combat, shooting, working out, taking care of yourself, the more you do to take care of yourself, the less likely you're, you are to get post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm gonna blow through the symptoms of PTSD because there's a lot of them, and I don't mean to scare anybody with them. Again, this is a train-to-trainer presentation, so I'm gonna give you a little more information than I would normally give, but there's a lot of them. Re-experiencing the traumatic event, avoiding reminders of the trauma. Drive down the street and going, I ain't going down that street unless I get a call there, you know what I mean? Increased anxiety and emotional arousal, intrusive, upsetting memories of the event, flashbacks, acting or feeling like the event is happening again. Doesn't mean you're sleeping. You could be sitting there watching TV and flash back to the event just like it happened, or just like it was happening again. Nightmares, either the event or other frightening things, is a question I always like to ask right now. How many cops in here, either retired or active, had that dream that their gun wasn't working? At one point or another. Yeah, it's usually a lot more than this. Come on, some people aren't wanting to answer, right? You had that dream where rubber bullets are coming out, can't pull the trigger, gun's not working. That's the most common. I was at a lecture once given by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. 80% of the cops in that room raised their hand. There was a lot of cops in that room. And uh, a lot of them, myself included, went, really? I thought that was my dream. You know, I mean, it's pretty common. Feelings of intense distress when reminding of the trauma. Intense physical reactions to reminders of the event, pounding heart, rapid breathing, nausea, mus muscle tension, sweating. Basically what that means is when you're having that flashback or you're thinking about this stuff, it comes back. You start feeling the same symptomology again. Other symptoms, avoidance and numbing, avoiding activities, places, thoughts, of, or feelings that remind you of the trauma, inability to remember important aspects of the trauma. That happens. One of the phenomenons is called auditory exclusion. I've been in two police shootings, and I know other people, Vince and Jonathan, a lot of us have been involved in shootings, biz. Auditory exclusion means you fire your weapon in the middle of something, and you don't remember the sound. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens the most. In fact, my first shooting, I can actually remember hearing the metal on the slide slap back and never heard the boom, never heard the boom. Uh, there's also like 
One of the things about shootings, I know from doing critical incident stress debriefings, years ago I was detailed to DEA, my boss got shot, it was at Job on Delaware Avenue. They sent us in to do a critical incident stress debriefing, and what happens with these traumatic events is different cops remember different things. And it's both good and bad. The best part is, is the cop that has doubts about what he or she did, it's usually wiped out right there. The cop will say, well, I should have done this, and I didn't do that. And another cop says, yeah, you did. It happens all the time because we act the way we're trained to do. Just mentioned this in passing. There's two parts of our brain that we need to be concerned with right now. There's the midbrain and the forebrain. The forebrain is the thinking brain. It's what we're using right now, hopefully. And the midbrain is the brain that we train. That is why, for instance, that, I think it's Amadou Diallo, that shooting in New York, there was 41 shots fired. They made such a big deal out of it. What happens at the range? On the line. Eyes and ears, protection in place. For uh, when the whistle blows, draw and fire. So what happens? Pop, every cop on the line goes. Pop, 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 pop. How many years do we do that? Over and over and over again, right? So you're on a shooting scene that some people call sympathetic response. I call it just plain old training. One cop fires, a half a dozen cops fire. Happens all the time. Some police departments are starting to do now, they're starting to do shoot, don't shoot scenarios. Targets are up, they don't know what target's coming at them. Whistle blows, targets turn, they have to assess the situation, shoot or don't shoot. I'm trying to break that a little bit, but that's why that's happened over the years. The good news is, the more you train, the better you act. My second police shooting, I say it all the time, my gun was unsnapped out of the holster, I was firing around down Ridgewood Street before I even realized my gun was in my hand, because that's what I trained to do. Irritability, outburst of anger, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance. We mentioned that earlier, hypervigilance, being on alert. Sometimes after traumatic events, you're on high alert all the time. When you're home, when you're in a grocery store, you know, you could be in a 7-Eleven buying a loaf of bread. Something falls off the shelf, smack, you're down and your gun's out. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. The inability to go back into that yellow, the caution move, well, that's happening. Feeling jump, jumpy and easily started. After my second shooting, I went to a fireworks event. <laughs> I had no idea what I was walking into. I was like, ah, somebody make them stop, ah. Eventually you get better with it, but at first, when you don't know that, like if somebody would have said to me, if you go to fireworks, you might have this reaction. I might not have had that reaction, but it's that exaggerated startle response. And the rocket's red glare, I wanted to dive under something. Completely shot. Anger and irritability, guilt, shame, or self-blame, substance abuse is prevalent, especially after a traumatic event. Feelings of mistrust and betrayal, like paranoid behavior. Cops have it, we have it worse after a trauma sometimes. Depression and hopelessness, feeling alienated and alone. Physical aches and pains. And before I bring up the last one, you need to know this. I said it in the beginning and I want to say it again. The reason why we don't put all these symptoms out there when we're doing suicide intervention training is we don't necessarily want to plant these seeds in people's minds, but we want them to know that if these things happen, you're not going crazy. It's normal. It can happen. But then we also follow it up by saying, doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it may. The most, the most important one for the purposes of this lecture is suicidal thoughts and feelings. People who have post-traumatic stress disorder can sometimes have thoughts of suicide, which doesn't seem to make sense. They're a survivor of a life or death experience, and then weeks or months later, they're thinking about suicide. But they need to know that that's natural. Sometimes you can diffuse that if that's reported just by telling them that that's as often a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. One of my favorite quotes comes from Bill Kennedy. It's not the lions and tigers that get the cops, it's the fleas and the gnats.